Versailles in the late 1700s is an oasis of extravagance, surrounded by a land in despair. And with an uncertain king at the helm, France is charting a course for disaster. After 19 years of marriage, Louis has sired four children. Yet as a king, he remains impotent. In an attempt to demonstrate leadership, Louis dabbles in financial reforms. But his misguided interfering burdens the poor with heavy taxes, while the nobility pay hardly at all. With the economy in ruins and the people restless, it seems as if even the heavens are angry, smiting France with the most bitterly cold winter in 90 years. If ever God intervened to make a situation worse, the summer of 1788 and the spring of 1789 is a moment when that happens. By the summer of 1788, you already have a burgeoning political crisis, and it's developing against a background of very serious food shortage. For the people of France in the 18th century, flour is the essence of life itself. Bread the measure of existence. Most ordinary people in France ate at least two pounds a day of bread. Bread was all important. Its price was immediately felt by everyone. If the price doubled, you were in big trouble. Under Louis's financial mismanagement, the cost of flour skyrockets. Sparse food supplies are hoarded. And the cost of a loaf of bread soon equals a month's earnings. Hunger turns to rage. Riots break out across France. Homes are robbed. Bakeries are raided. And shopkeepers suspected of stockpiling bread are lynched on the spot. With the economy in shambles, the banks force Louis to hire a finance minister, Jacques Necker. An enlightened thinker, Necker is popular with the people in a way that Louis can only envy. Jacques Necker was undoubtedly the most popular minister throughout the spring of 89 because he's taken the line publicly in his writings that the government's duty is to make sure that there is enough bread and grain for everybody. The nation in fiscal crisis, Necker urges Louis to call a meeting of the traditional representative body of the kingdom, the Estates General. It is the first time the representatives have been called together in 175 years. France was politically organized in something called the Estates. The first estate was the clergy, the second estate was the nobility, and the third estate was everyone else. And by a contemporary reckoning, the first two estates uh, occupied 3% of the population, and the third estate, 97% of the population. A lot of people felt it was very unfair for this third estate, which was most of the population, to only have one-third of the deputies. They felt it was very unfair that this should be a three-chamber parliament, where two chambers, the nobility and the clergy, could always outvote the commoners. May 4th, 1789. A skilled young lawyer and politician arrives at Versailles. Maximilien Robespierre comes to stand before the Estates General as a deputy to fight for a fair voice for the people he represents, the Third Estate. An orphan from the provinces, Robespierre had risen to academic prominence on a prestigious scholarship, becoming an eloquent speaker prim in appearance, with never a hair nor a phrase out of place. Back home in the small town of Arras, the Enlightenment ideas he had absorbed in the salons of Paris found a powerful voice as he became a hometown lawyer for the downtrodden. By the time he went back and started to practice as a lawyer, he was reading very widely in the Enlightenment. And Robespierre was someone who, when he was practicing law in Arras, tried to actually bring the ideas of the Enlightenment into the cases he was fighting. At the Estates General, Robespierre and his colleagues are demanding that the nobility and clergy pay taxes. But Louis feels increasingly threatened by the growing radicalism of the Third Estate. 
Then, on June 20th, after a six-week deadlock, the deputies arrive to find that they are being silenced. On June 20th, when the deputies come to their meeting and find the doors locked, they suspect a plot. They move next door to what we call a tennis court, which was really a handball court, and gather together and swear they will not stop meeting until they have a new constitution. The deputies declare themselves a new national assembly, the true representatives of the people of France. The tennis court oath is one of these great symbolic moments in the history of the French Revolution. You had these people assembled in this great open space of the tennis court, raising their arms in this sort of quasi-Roman salute. And for the National Assembly, this was a moment when they realized something of their power and their dignity and saw that they really could defy France's king. In one revolutionary stand of defiance, the National Assembly is born. It will be a communion of voices from around the country parliamentary body enacting the people's will. But wresting power from the king would not be so easy as signing a simple proclamation. All of these early victories that take place at Versailles are largely paper victories, and they have no teeth to back them up. And the fear that it happens that it takes over the deputies at Versailles as we approach mid-July mid -July, is that the king is gathering his forces to disperse them, to overthrow them. By early July, 30,000 of the king's troops are taking positions around Paris. To defend themselves, the people form a new National Guard. Rioters raid Paris's armories and make away with over 28,000 muskets. The only thing missing is gunpowder, and the people know just where to get it. In the center of Paris, there looms a massive stone dungeon notorious as a symbol of feudal rule, the Bastille. The prison houses the city's stores of gunpowder and is legendary as a den of torture and unspeakable deaths. The Bastille had been the great symbol of royal despotism, the great symbol of the kings of France running beyond the just limits of their own power, a symbol of horror for the people of France. Amidst the rioting, there is a stunning outrage. Louis fires his finance minister, the people's beloved Jacques Necker, seen as too sympathetic to the masses. Hours after Necker is fired, word reaches Paris that their man on the inside has been ousted. There is nothing left but revolt. On July 14th, crowds band together identifying themselves with a small cockade, red and blue for the colors of Paris, separated by white, the color of the House of Bourbon. The tricolor is born. From the feverish crowd, a voice cries out to the Bastille. Attacking the Bastille means that the people of Paris are saying, you cannot get rid of the new National Assembly. The people are acting, they're arming themselves, and they're basically saying, we take the side of the revolution.